right. All right. Well, hello, 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 and good morning, and welcome to Intercultural Spark, that show about how you too can spark change in the world through your uh, mission-driven businesses and life projects. I am your host, Deanna Shas, and I'm so grateful that you've joined us today, or if you're joining after the fact, equally grateful. Uh, I hope that you will be inspired by today's guest about how you too can make change in the world with everything that you do. So speaking of today's guest, I'm excited to welcome Scott Silverstein, who is the uh, co-founder and executive producer of HMS Media. Uh, Scott, actually, it's a 33-year-old com company. They've won 20 Emmy Awards. But what's so interesting is when you ask Scott about his business, all he wants to do is talk about all the relationships and how the length of and breadth of uh, relationships in his life have driven his success. So welcome to Intercultural Spark. Hi, Scott. Hello. Good to see you. You too. You too. Thanks so much for being here. And speaking of long relationships, we have known each other probably going on good almost 20 years. I think it's been going on a at while. Least, at least I think you're so, right. Yeah. yeah. And just met through sort of arts and tourism and things like that within the, the city of Chicago. That's right. Yeah. So, and how yeah. lucky am I for that? Thank you for that. Yeah, well, actually, thank you. So that was when we needed uh, entertainment for the, it was when Midway Airport, the new Midway was first opening and you called and you're like, I've got like three hours worth of film. Can you use it? Right. And so that's what ran on all the tourism videos on all the, um, oh, the screens over the baggage claim in the airport I for years. I, I remember so. that accompanied by some U2 music, if I recall correctly. So yeah, it was a, that was, that was an exciting project to be able to welcome people to a city with the arts. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a better way to do it. It's uh, it, it tells us it, it I think helped tell people who we are and what they were in for and what they could explore. And uh, that was a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, and what I think about that, though, is your emphasis about relationships mm -hmm. um, and that you are really proud of, you said, of your longtime relationships. And so I'm just wondering what works for you in terms of maintaining and building relationships. You know, you could even start, you've known your business partner for probably 40 years. Uh, 44. We were best friends <laughs> at summer camp um, uh, as, as kids. And mm -hmm. um, and then the the third person who started the company with us, uh, we were camp counselors together. Oh, fun. So yeah, so uh, um, you know, I, I am proud of those relationships and and all that have sustained us. I'm I'm even more so humbled by them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love how much work goes into them, but I love how much bang you get for the emotional, mental, intellectual, psychological buck. Um, yeah, I think it's important to to wanna to really want to hang out with the people you work with. Mm -hmm. Some of this stuff sounds so so simple and and yet so often we don't do it. I I often am asked was it dangerous or risky or did you ever feel it would be a terrible idea to go into business with a friend? Mm -hmm. And my response is who else would I want to be in business with? Uh you know I'm I'm, I'm getting married a week from Sunday and it's almost as if someone Congratulations. Would say, Thank you. <laughs> uh and it's almost as if someone would say, well, you guys are going to be doing a lot of stuff together and and mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, raising a family and and that's hard work. You, you, you sure you want to do that with a friend? Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> these are these are intimate things, and it takes a lot of our a lot of our time and energy. So why wouldn't you want to have a great relationship with them? Mm -hmm. It's it's sometimes easier to segment yourself off and compartmentalize yourself, but easy doesn't necessarily mean productive or successful or or nourishing or successful or innovative mm -hmm. for that matter. You got to be vulnerable enough to try stuff and you tend not to do that as easily unless you're predisposed to certain kinds of, of rhythms, uh, um, games we would call them in the improv world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, ways where you're ready to surrender something up to the best idea in the mm -hmm. room. So it strikes me though, when you talk about relationship, let's say with a business partner or congratulations on getting married, that, that you know that there's that commitment and you've got that day-to-day -day, um, dynamic. So that there's a lot invested because there's so much on the line. Yeah. But I think about particularly being in the world of theater which there's so many egos involved and so many people with their own agendas. How do you maintain 
those kinds of relationships, either with, with clients or, you know, you had even said vendors, but maybe ones where you're not talking to someone for a year and then you want to reach out to them because you want more business from them. How do you maintain those relationships? I think I would first say that I, I don't see the, the the theater, dance, music, performing arts worlds in general of, of, of uh, being defined by outsized egos. Um, I, I, I think you'll, you'll find ego problems in any area of life, mm-hmm. uh, in any facet of work. Uh, and I think when in the arts, my you bump into some people who are who are more difficult than others. Occasionally, we ourselves are more difficult than we want to be. But we are we are <laughs> called right. Um, but we are called to do something that is bigger than ourselves and requires collaboration. Um, there is no, if I may tip my political hand, there is no room for I alone can fix it. That's mm-hmm. nonsense. Uh, and and nobody really can, and nobody really has. Um, uh, generally speaking, there there are so there's so little room for those absolute singular rights and wrongs. So mm-hmm. I, I find actually, uh, while there is competitive behavior, and any field worth being in is competitive, I I think it is outweighed by mm-hmm. the extraordinary cooperative behavior, mm-hmm. and that's something I find far more in a performing arts environment than I do in in some other business environments. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get into it for collaboration. You get into it to do things you couldn't do elsewhere. You, you get into it to to understand and be understood. Empathy is part of our currency. It's why people love doing it and not necessarily for giant paychecks. You are achieving an awful lot of good for yourself and for others. Um, and and so I don't I don't actually find that the egos really are are the problem. You're there. There are far bigger problems in in other areas where money is ultimately the bottom line or power is the bottom line. Here we're trying to tell stories. We're trying to do what Looking Glass Theater calls change, charge, and empower. You only do that in collaboration with people that you trust. Mm -hmm. So actually, hi to Brianna and hi to Stephanie. Thank you both for being here. And for everyone who's joining us live, we invite you to say hello and leave uh, questions or or comments in the comments. Uh, So actually, Brianna, love this. There's no room for I can, I alone can fix it. Uh, Definitely words to live by. Right on, Brianna. Um, I'm with her. I'm with you on that. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, but you do work, you know, you do work in a field. Well, I guess I'm going to go back to looking glass for a minute. Cause when you talk yeah. about how things work collaboratively, you had mentioned that you were a member of the ensemble at looking glass theater. I had always thought of that as like the performers who perform there. How did you end up being an ensemble uh, member? And then what does that mean on the production side as being sure. part of the ensemble? Well, technically, I'm what's called an artistic associate, which is this next group of of, of kind of supporting artists that support the, I guess, mm-hmm. approximately twenty four member ensemble. Uh, so, yes, to be clear, I mean my my primary gig is is exec producing and leading and, and doing mm-hmm. a, a lot of project development and and writing and producing and directing at, at HMS through collaborative relationships mm-hmm. with with Looking Glass, which really started. We were we were on a shoot with them. Uh, to create a uh, promo v- material for race. This was the Studs Terkel book that was adapted by David mm-hmm. Schwimmer and Joy Gregory. Okay. Uh, and Schwimmer directed it to open the space. And we got into a wonderful conversation where realizing we had very little time and there was a lot for them still to do to mm-hmm. get the show open. We said, hey, listen, uh, the B-roll crew coming in to get press footage doesn't have to be the antithesis of what you're doing. Nobody knows the show better, television better than you. I know mm-hmm. my crew. Let's make something together. And and the spark of that working with Swimmer led to a full capture of that, which led to an opportunity to see how Looking Glass worked and how HMS worked. Mm-hmm. Um, being in an ensemble, you know, uh, uh, Chicago is renowned for its ensemble theater uh, mm-hmm. history. Steppenwolf is a classic sure. example of this. Um, and, and a lot of us at Looking Glass learned uh, what we want to do and how we might want to do some things differently at Steppenwolf. But ultimately what you see is, um, you know, you don't have to have the most lines in the play. Sometimes the key thing you do is you show up silently and you have an amazing moment to play. It's always mm. about the story. It's always about the full production. It's always about something that you share collaboratively. Uh, and to do that, you it's not just actors. You need someone to write. You need someone to direct. You need someone mm-hmm. to produce. Someone's got to light it. Someone's got to make costumes. Someone's got to design sets. Looking Glass is, is a wonderful example of this because its ensemble is not just actors. There's plenty of names on that ensemble list that you are not going to see on stage. 
Mm -hmm. Costume designers like Mara Bloomfield and, and, and Dan Osling who does sets and uh, myself as an artistic associate, I'm, I'm all behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Someone so, who's in the show this time, next show might have written or directed it or just been there to help with some, some doctoring of the script. Sure. You know, I wonder, I was looking at your website earlier. So obviously you've done work with Hamilton and it sounds right. like filming entire things or filming productions. When you were talking about collaboration, I'm just going to play if this will come up just a half a second of this video. Because when you talk about collaboration, how do you even do something like this? So this is the cast of, uh, of uh, uh, what do you call it? Of Beautiful. A, of Beautiful, the Carol King musical. Hey, wait, listen to one second. I want people to listen Please to one hold. second of this. Because this is amazing sound coordination. All right, I'm going to stop because I want you to talk about it. how do you even do something like that? You, How do you have control over what um, each place is filming and then putting it together? And then we have a bunch of questions from people who are watching as well. But that seems like like that had to have been huge cooperation and collaboration to make something like that happen. It was. The root, the genesis of that project is a longstanding friendship with Jason Howland, uh, who Chicago people will be able to see his new musical, Paradise Square, open here uh, at Broadway in Chicago shortly. Mm -hmm. Jason, we worked back when he was he wrote the music for Little Women. Uh, we stayed great pals. We did a PBS special together, a rock version of, of Handel's Messiah uh, and, and, and other projects in between. The mm -hmm. pandemic hit, and I think one of the things when we see a video like that, I think it's automatically going to trigger, oh my God, April 2020. Nobody could go anywhere. Everyone was home. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing you do when you asked about control, I think the first thing you do is say, I don't have any. Um, you know, how do you make this happen? Sometimes the best way to start that answer is, I don't know. What about this? Um, mm -hmm. What it took was Jason saying, I've got this I idea. The Actors Fund is going to need help. Actors everywhere are going to need help. It's chaotic as things are now. Gosh, you well remember the 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 way our our, our lives were just stopped in, right. in, in March of 2020. Uh, and the arts uh, are among those those few industries that will be, they were the first to close and will be the last to reopen. And many aren't reopening still for a little while, even though we're kind of on our way. So we looked at what we had. We did, we to steal improv mm -hmm. parlance, we said, yes, and. We want to do this. We have singers. We have musicians. We had we have producing capability. We have edit suites. We mm -hmm. let's let's try to do stuff that we could never do before. We haven't thought about. We made our phones and our edit suites and our recording equipment do stuff that a lot of people had never thought about. Oh, that led to a whole another original murder mystery musical that Jason wrote that we further pushed everything that we. Oh, had and that and came out of all this big collaboration. It's called a killer party. Yeah, it's still wow. available online. And and mm -hmm. but again, that goes back to you know not just Matt and me going way back. Mm -hmm. But that show features Jesse Mueller, who we've been shooting with here for a long time. Sure, Jason, who we've known since Little Women, which is 2003, mm -hmm. 2004, something like that. Long so time Scott, relationship. Yeah, so it sounds like with those relationships, it's interesting because Brianna is also asking, you know, how do you find people who don't want to take over? But it sounds like with those relationships that are in place, that every time there's a new idea, that it really is cooperative in terms of how things come together. And as Stephanie says, she's long appreciated the looking glass ensemble driven model for other types of businesses. So, so it sounds like even just maintaining a little bit of that spirit in, uh, yeah. in creating things. There, you know, um, there are, listen, we know other people who make, who make television here and we have other vendors who know other people who shoot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the world is better off if we're all doing our best in similar fields. Again, competition is a great thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and not just because it, it, it drives you to succeed, but I think more than anything else, it drives you to excellence. It depends on what you're competing against. What I find here, and one of the reasons that we're based in Chicago is mm -hmm. unlike other places, I mean, traditionally, I, I, there are other cities, other markets, other, other businesses where the competition is against people. I think what we, while that can happen in the mm -hmm. fields that I'm in, the way we're working it, um, my experience is we're competing against the standard more than other people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're aiming for this perfect thing. Mm -hmm. We're only going to get so close to it. We will find joy in the process of getting there and hopefully some satisfaction in the space mm -hmm. in between. And if it's more standards-based competition, then cutthroat, I'm going to push you down the stairs so I can get this gig. I don't experience that here. And part of that is I don't invite it into my life personally. Mm -hmm. HMS does not invite it into its life professionally. Those people are out there. Sometimes they've come after us. They don't, they tend not to win because we don't play that. Mm -hmm. We don't play, we don't play that. And people know that we're there to support 
to lead, lead by following all the things sure. you learn in ensemble and improv driven ethics, which I learned in the Chicago, particularly the uh, theater world. Sure, well that is music. very typical of Chicago. So I have a question. It's shifting the idea of competition and, and remaining competitive, but not being competitive. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with tech, because I imagine when you opened the company 33 years ago, you were using very different equipment and producing film oh, gosh. compared to now. So what's an example of one of the biggest changes that you've seen with them? Um, with tech and then how do you go about learning new tech or new ways of doing things because it's it's going to keep changing comparatively speaking when we started we yeah. were we were using you know we were we were rubbing two sticks together and using an right. extra sketch um <laughs> you know uh digital the emergence of digital is obviously it's it's uh mm. it sounds like it, it is an oversimplification but that that changed an awful lot i mean i think the the, sure. the thing that really changed though is Again, I always bring it back to relationships. How has changing technology allowed us to connect mm -hmm. to each other, create for each other, and create with each other? The You've Got a Friend video that you showed, mm -hmm. you know, this was before uh, a lot of people beefed up their, their own existing technologies, beefed up their internet, beefed up what their phones could do. Um, so it, it's technology changes all the time. The consistent thing is um, how can we listen and respond to each other? How can we take a situation and kind of agree with its reality and explore it and heighten it, right? And again, mm -hmm. all terminologies that you'll hear a lot of folks in the improv world use because that's how improvisation mm -hmm. works. You, you, you remain as unattached to outcomes as possible. You may have mm -hmm. a mission. The mission in a in a, a scene in an improv show is is it's usually mm -hmm. not primarily mm -hmm. laughter. It's empath an empathic connection for truth, and we tend to respond mm -hmm. to things we recognize and find them funny. Mm -hmm. It's not jokes, right? So you try you, you don't necessarily go for the laugh. You go for the truth. That is irregardless of what kind of technology you have. That said, of course, you have to pay attention to it because people are going to expect things shot, edited, delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, at well, a I was rate just going to say, different. yeah, when you talk about letting go of control, that seems so counterintuitive to me because ultimately you're delivering a final product to your client sure. that is this highly controlled and highly produced piece of work. You are, uh, and and it it it's you you kind of have to balance the the cognitive dissonance that those two different ideas have because mm -hmm. you know, when we do, for example, when we when we produced um, a tribute to my my longtime mentor and dear friend John Kander of Kander and Ebb, this is the songwriting team that gave us New York, New York, Chicago, Cabaret, yeah. and so on. Uh, uh, the the not only one of the most talented, but easily the kindest person I've I've known, and you, mm -hmm. you can't get much luckier than to be mentored by a person like that. And PBS asked us if if we would develop uh, something for the PBS Arts Fall Festival and we pitched a tribute to Kander and Ebb. Okay, well, then I go sit down with John and I have this idea and then John's got some ideas and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get organized around John's because he wrote the stuff and he's gentle and he's, he, mm -hmm. he knows his material. So he suggested some collaborators. I didn't have them in mind at first. I didn't even know mm -hmm. them, but I go now, some of them mm -hmm. are some of my dearest friends, who then uh, we went to, we, we were gonna recreate a pre-existing review and adapt it for television. Not all the cast was available. We found uh, the amazing Kate Baldwin, who was from around here, born in Evanston, went to Northwestern. Did not know Kate before, a longtime admirer of her. She came in to learn a new show. We got to be friendly. We're actually mm -hmm. developing a new series for PBS right now. Oh, if nice. I was attached to the idea that I originally had, which was here are my 12 favorite Candor and Ebb songs and the 15 people I would like to sing and play them, I would have been deprived of the opportunity to meet mm -hmm. Heidi Blickenstaff, Kate Baldwin, Norm Lewis, learn the songs that I didn't know that were sure. astonishing, find moments even as we were shooting, like, oh gosh, we could put Kate here, but if we put her up here and mm -hmm. create a new jib shot, had sure. a whole show. And then PBS said, you know mm. what? We need you to reorder the songs. Oh, wow. Okay. I was attached, deeply attached to a running order. Sure. Changed it based on their suggestion, which I didn't think made any sense when I first got it. However, there was a way to answer it where it made extraordinary sense. I never would have thought of it otherwise. And the show took on an even higher form. So if I was attached to outcomes and controlling all the way, the show would have been fine. It would have been nice. Might have been really good. This would never have happened without- I love like, the idea. It would have been this. fine. People know fine and people know no extraordinary. I, so, like to, I like to steal from Roy Kent from, from Ted Lasso. Don't you dare mm -hmm. settle for fine. <laughs> sure. All right. So 
Uh, speaking of all the breadth of what you do, which we weren't, but now I'm going to go to it and all the opportunities. And actually, I know what the transition is. Speaking of not going fine and going to be uh, uh, Emmy Award winning, we are going to go to the part of the show called the Flash Photo Stories. Oh. <laughs> okay. So uh, with the Flash Photo Stories, I'm going to flash a photo that you have sent me, and then you are going to tell me what it is is okay so uh uh brianna says that's a great lesson in being flexible thank you i was, thinking I, it was. Being, I appreciate that thank you yeah i was thinking too you were talking about ensemble something about what you're saying really solidified that idea of an ensemble which is different people lead at different times that's right and how you just incorporate it into your life so all right so you're dressed very nicely and you have a statue in your hand what's going on yeah. here well, the first thing I noticed mm. is I haven't changed a bit in all these years. Exactly. That is, that is uh, the fall of 1990. And Matt and mm. I have just received our first two Emmy Awards for a project called a, a documentary that aired on PBS called Why Am I Hiding? This was uh, a project that we started uh, when MHMS started. We had no money to give to social service groups. And we wanted to be able to do that. But we had mm. access to gear before we owned all our own stuff. And we volunteered to make training tapes for a couple not-for-profits. I chose, for a lot of mm -hmm. reasons, mm -hmm. rape, rape Victim Advocates, which at the time was the only community-based uh, organization for survivors of sexual assault. This 10-minute mm -hmm. training tape evolved into a broadcast documentary that Susan Rutan from LA Law hosted. Suzanne Vega gave us songs to, to utilize in it. And most, what, it, what it did is it told the story of survivors of sexual assault in what we later learned was the first broadcast documentary to give voice to survivors of, of sexual assault. Never had any idea that's where we were headed. But again, the universe gives you an mm -hmm. opportunity. You yes and it. The icing on the cake was lovely, lovely to get those um, uh, the Emmys sure. um, for producing and directing. What was really awesome is the the documented thousands of people who reached out to social service organizations oh, who never knew they did. They thought they were alone and didn't know they could get the help. Wow, so, that's amazing. So, did you go? Have you you went to the Emmys when that was there? Did you get to go? Yes. Yeah, okay. that was that was that was exciting. That's the Texas. Mm -hmm. This is Camp Nabagaman. This is where Matt and is I met. Is this where you and Matt met when you were like 13? Is this the talent show at camp? Our first production was the camp version of Beatlemania, which we called Beatlemania Mania. It. That's Matt is Ringo on the Pow Wow Day drums, and uh, which we no longer call Pow Wow Day. Um, <laughs> our homemade our homemade um, uh, and apologies for that. That's an old reflex because that's what it was called. Not called that anymore. Um, and you know, well, actually, not called that just because it was something that camps did to kind of be cute. And now you realize there's so much ritual that goes around, um, around the whole idea of powwow and ownership of Native American culture. So it's for sure. Well, look at, be, look at yeah, the bodies. Look at the, look at the deeply privileged bodies that are there, and all the things that we have to learn. And again, the first thing you do is go. I got to learn more about that. I'm wrong about that, even mm -hmm. though it's in my yeah. head. Their instincts got to kick those away. So I'm I always am working on that. I'm a, mm -hmm. a straight white American guy. My blind spots are enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, however well intentioned I am, and I have to pay attention to that and work harder. Sure. That's me on the piano, uh, um, and we're opening the show with "I Want to Hold Your Hand." And Camp Nabagaman, when Camp Nabagaman wrote its history, there was a chapter on the Camp Follies, and the people featured were John Kander, who was my dad's counselor. Which is how I know him. He was my dad's counselor in back in the forties, and wow. us. Um, so that's oh, our, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's Kate Baldwin uh, singing "New York, New York." Um, we knew there was going to be in, in the PBS uh, special that we did, First You mm -hmm. Dream, the, the music of Candor and Ebb. Kate, who came in relatively last minute, knocked this out like a pro, and she was told, you're going to sing New York, New York. Now, who wants to sing a song that everybody associates with Frank Sinatra and Liza Minnelli sure. and the New York Yankees? How do you make it surprising? And we said, trust us, it's going to be surprising. Started it as a ballad. So people had to listen to the song in a way they'd never heard before and realize mm. it's not about confidence. It's about the lack of it. It's the bad of, gosh, I'm here and I really want to get there. Mm. Kate embraced that. We literally put her on a pedestal. And the moment in that show, which you can still see online, I'm sure there's a YouTube clip of it, mm -hmm. just the house exploded. This was at the North Shore Center Performing Arts in Skokie, which was amazing. And again, never would have known Kate if we didn't do that project. Sure. That's a project that we were shooting called God of Dirt. And if you pay really close attention to the people around you, you'll recognize remarkable folks. The un un uncharacteristically stern looking person to the right of me, mm -hmm. uh, I'm marrying a week from Sunday. Oh. <laughs> um, 
but we were we met on a PBS shoot working on with Jump Rhythm Jazz Project, and I Fantastic. saw her engage in improvisational and ensemble behavior like few people I saw. And I said, I got to know that person, mm -hmm. and we've known each other a long, long time, been through a lot, and all these years later, we're we're finally uh, tying the knot. That's fantastic, and I think you said you had to postpone it once because of the uh, because of the pandemic. Twice because of the pandemic, Ugh. and now we're just going to get married by outdoors by the lake with immediate family. We'll get to the big party later, but you got to pay attention to the people in the room. If I have I just have I just been purely focusing on my shot and what I thought was going to come out of this shoot, which was entirely improv based, an improviser from Second City exploring the world of dance to kind of get people in, you know, mm -hmm. give them a way into it. Um, I, pay attention to the whole room and how are people responding? And she was luminous and is even more so now. <laughs> um, there's our buddy Miguel Cervantes uh, shooting Hamilton, mm -hmm. the Chicago company. Miguel's on Broadway mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, and Miguel, not only did we get to meet Miguel on the shoot and do this, this extraordinary production and to be around Jeffrey Seller, who we've known for many, many years back since we shot uh, Rent, uh, among as many other, going that far back in the Heights and High Fidelity. Um, Laura Madelon, who I met on a, Ma a Mamma Mia shoot, winds up working for this show. We all come together. And then since mm -hmm. then, Miguel, who tragically lost his daughter uh, to uh, childhood mm -hmm. epilepsy, we've worked with him since then, just finished a project where we did a benefit video to, for uh, Cure, an organization out of New York that's raising money for epilepsy. And just because we mm -hmm. we showed up and paid attention to each other and we, be, we became pals. He's also in a killer party, uh, the one that I mentioned before. So our paths stay intertwined. Yeah, I just wanted to share those good wishes from uh, Stephanie for your um, uh, for your upcoming marriage. You're and awesome, think... Stephanie. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, there's my Looking Glass family. Some of them, oh, not God. all of them, but uh, that's this is Looking Glass when we learned we were receiving the 2011 uh, Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater. Um, and there are many, many founders and ensemble members in the company right here and a lot of staff members at the time. You know, this was eight kids at Northwestern who said, let's keep, um, much the way HMS did, let's keep doing things, telling stories the way we want to tell them on stage with cameras and see what happens. And what happened was we all wound up uh, at um, uh, uh, in New York at the Tony Awards receiving that the same night, my dear pal, John Kander, uh, was uh, his show, The Scottsboro Boys, had 11 Tony Award nominations, and The Book of Mormon, which we want, well, so shot, mm -hmm. took them all home. So, you know, even in a big environment like that, that was like going to a wedding or a family reunion. Um, well, we are, I do want to get to our interpretive exercise of the day. One, I'm going to say one quick question. There's no way this is a quick question, but I'm going to yeah. frame it that way. Because you had said that most happy people you know align who they are with what they do. Is there one thing that encapsulates that idea for you in terms of like a core value that you have that drives the work that you do? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's that whatever I do, I want, I don't mind succeeding. I'd like to be as successful as possible as long as other people benefit first and succeed first and more, ideally. Um, curiosity. So and say that again. So you uh, said I want you other. I, I you know I I loved. Well, the why am I hiding is, is a great example. It's a blast to win an Emmy award. Mm -hmm. It would have meant absolutely nothing, truly, if the show didn't help a bunch of other people. What was really mm -hmm. exciting about sure. that is that people who needed help got it. What was the next show that we won our Emmys for was a piece about River North Dance Company. Nobody knew who they were. We worked mm -hmm. hard to get them on sure. PBS, and they became a cultural touchstone in, in oh, Chicago. Fantastic. So sure. everything we do is, uh, I, as long as other people benefit first and benefit more, if we're, uh, mm. and as long as we have a complete understanding of what we're doing, if you're really involved in the arts, you're able to make not only arguments for how good quality storytelling helps you on stage. I mean, the political mess we're in right now is because mm. we have one group of people that's not telling stories effectively enough and another who's telling bad stories and mm -hmm. dishonest stories. Neither one of those are great. That's part of why there's all this logjam. I swear, I want to bring Congress to Chicago for three months to take theater and improv classes, to learn about listening and responding and 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 knowing what it is that you absolutely need other people, especially those that who don't That is agree a great idea. Get them all here, and it might make a few molecules of difference, mm -hmm. but that would be. But the yes be and at least acknowledges that people that people have ideas. You heard it here first, everyone. When there's improv going on in Congress, so I love the idea of those. Yeah, guys. not Jake, because um, what the Congress, what 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 people get in trouble when they do the antithesis of yes and, which is mm -hmm. no because. 
Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are a lot, not all of them. There are some spectacular people on both sides of the aisle who so, actually are engaged in all of this. I, I want to bring, frankly, I want to bring Congressman <clears throat> Kinzinger and Congresswoman Schakowsky's staff together to do improv workshops and show how people of different predispositions mm -hmm. can do what they need to do. That would be a spectacular exercise. I think I'm going to do that. Let's let's see what happens. But, okay, um, and let's film it and watch it because that would be fantastic to watch. I think watch. it would be really interesting so. because you'll, you'll, it's it's power and that kind of posturing and an attachment to the need for the attachment to outcome and power. Okay, people Brianna's are in. We've got people in on this idea of doing. All right, you're the, coming uh, with us. You're going to improvise yeah, with us. We're Brianna. absolutely doing it. All right, now to go completely from something that you just said, which is all about depth and meaning. Technically, interpretive aerobics is about depth and meaning because people communicate different ways. Yeah. So I always include the interpretive exercise of the week. Yeah. So ta da our flash exercise. So this is an exercise that relates to the theme of the show. I'm going to make me full screen for a minute. I'm going to let people do this in your chair. Ultimately, I'm going to suggest that when you do this after the show, your homework, that you open a door and do this against the thin edge of a door. But let me make myself full screen to show you our exercise for today. So I'm going to take you out for one second here. All right. So this is actually a posture exercise that I'm doing for, well, I'll let you figure out why I'm doing it. So I'm going against the, um, the edge of my cabinet here is what I'm doing. So this is a cabinet. There's a sharp edge. You put your tail on the edge of the door, or in my case, the cabinet. So knees are slightly bent, put your tail on the edge and then un unfold your spine so that every single vertebrae is touching the edge. So for me, that edge of that cabinet is on my spine. You take your hands and then you open and if you're on a door, you actually grab the two handles on either side. Make sure your head is against that. Your chin is parallel to the floor and you're reaching back with your spine uh, touching every vertebrae of the edge of the cabinet or the door. Okay. So that is our, I like to call it a posture exercise. Uh, Scott, you can do it in your chair if you like. Uh my bride to be my uh, Jackie's a Pilates instructor. Oh, and she is. I, so she a great one. So I, I, I do this. We do this. <laughs> it's, okay. And it's um, it's amazing when you listen to what your body, much like I think in the art in the arts world, when you there's sometimes projects tell you what they want to be. Your body tells you a lot about where it oh, wants to go. Your body tells you right? and stuff. We keep okay. jamming it in funky directions, but yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. When you realize, oh. That's how my spine works. Mm -hmm. That's where the so body's supposed to go. Why do you think we chose that? I chose we. I like that. That's the editorial we. Why do you think we chose that exercise for today's show? Well, we <laughs> would have to say that um, uh, um, it's. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to work hard at this one because at first I saw it and I went, oh, Jackie has me do this all the time. I get that. Um, so I first of all, I just like the serendipity of that because it's really nice to be taught Pilates by, by your your, your best friend, <laughs> um, who, who, and someone who observes you, um, and, and sees. So, uh, I am going to speculate that it has something to do with, um, uh, especially with knees bent into the ground. There is mm -hmm. something great about, about grounding yourself in the earth. Ooh, so much of what we talk about is, is it. up posture like this. And so yep. little of that is actually that great for you. In fact, a lot of times you're, we're doing this and shortening our spines. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, right. And so, uh, uh, the idea of, of planting your feet, bending your knees. So you're, you're, you're dealing with the gravity that you're, that you live within, which I think reminds me of the, the gravity of all of our lives and situations and the idea of, of extending and understanding where, where your body is is really meant to go and to pay attention to the fact that that a, a lot of the the healthiest things whether it's physically psychologically relationally are are obvious pay attention to every one of those things let things unfold as they naturally can unfold but put in the work to make sure you get there because it will not happen without work that's my thought I love it. Not only really, actually, and that's a perfect example of how you look at all the details. And now I'm just flushing. Let's just talk about, let's just like acknowledge the depth that Scott brings to the world and how superficial I am because there were a couple reasons. <laughs> one is, one is I'm like, oh, theater. So I got dressed. I dressed. Remember when people used to get dressed for the theater? I've got my fancy earrings on. I'm dressed for the theater. And then good posture, because I'm thinking also, you know, I live for the dance. Like that great posture of theater and dance. So actually, that wasn't my idea. I'm sure that was someone else's interpretation. We're going with Scott's about <laughs> staying grounded and standing tall. So Scott, 
Thank you so much for joining us today on oh, Intercultural Spark. Just, I just have so many ideas. I just want to go out and like look at things because you've really opened my mind to look at things differently. So I'm looking forward to future collaborations and opportunities to work together. Love it. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Scott. A pleasure. And I encourage anyone who has cool ideas and wants to pursue stuff. It's all about new ideas and the relationships. You know, there's still room room for new ones. So I love hearing from people and and the opportunities for new brainstorms and. Uh, um, how can we help? How can we make stuff? You know, there's uh, there's a lot of great new relationships still to be made. So. Oh, good. So Thanks. Benna's watching. Benna, you Benna's calling. So we have a project for you. We will talk. So <laughs> more to come. This was a fun. <laughs>